Good afternoon. Today, I am sad to report House Republicans again failed to deliver on a budget agreement. Over the last several months, I have been flexible, I have been patient, as they have repeatedly failed to agree amongst themselves on how they're going to approach the budget. House Republicans continue to prolong and delay the debate over the means to pay for the programs they themselves voted to pass overwhelmingly in June. They have worked tirelessly to block a severance tax at the expense of finishing the budget process months ago. In February, I proposed a budget that balanced, and I, it balanced by implementing more than $2 billion in cuts, in savings, in efficiencies, and relying on a severance tax and closing loopholes. I proposed this budget to begin a conversation on what I thought was a common ground. I was optimistic. Despite the historically divided government, big conservative, very conserv big and very conservative Republican majorities, and a Democratic governor, we were making real progress, I thought. We had made strides on many issues over the last year and a half. Working together, we legalized medical marijuana. We legalized, uh, we legalized medical marijuana. We instituted meaningful liquor reform for the first time since prohibition. We invested in education at all levels, at historic levels. We have a fair funding formula, substantive measures to combat the heroin opioid epidemic in Pennsylvania. Pension reform, that had been at the top of the Republican leader to-do list for decades. Yet I, a Democratic governor with Republican majorities in both houses in the, both House and the Senate, brought it across the finish line. But despite these efforts, despite these indications of our ability to work together, one thing has become abundantly clear. Too many Republicans in the legislature are more focused on the 2018 elections than on helping Pennsylvania succeed. They'd rather see me fail than Pennsylvania succeed. They'd rather protect special interests, they'd rather protect lobbyists and campaign donors than do the right thing. I'm not gonna play their games anymore, so I'm drawing a line in the sand. Yesterday, just yesterday, they said they could not pass their own House Republican proposal to lift the exemption on commercial storage. Now their proposal to tax hotels has too failed. The fairest and simplest solution to this challenge would have been, and still is, to replace these taxes with a severance tax. It would produce the same amount. And it's widely supported, this is the thing, that severance tax is widely supported throughout the Commonwealth and among bipartisan legislators. And that was evidenced just a few months ago by the responsible action taken by the Senate. It's common sense. Pennsylvania is the only major gas producing state in the nation without a severance tax. The House could still put this in and we could still have a vote this week to get this done. Doing this would bring together a budget with ideas from all caucuses and from the administration. The House Republicans had every opportunity to put a balanced budget on my desk and they have continuously failed. So in the absence of a compromise revenue plan getting to my desk, I'm taking action on my own to manage our state's finances. I'm gonna take immediate steps to address the deficit. First, I'm going to initiate plans to securitize the cash payments from our state's liquor system. That's going to raise $1.25 billion to pay off nearly all of our prior year deficit and significantly reduce the need for additional temporary borrowing to pay our bills. The Liquor Control Board sent $210 million into the general fund last year, far in excess of the annual amount necessary to make payments on this loan. This would be structured similarly to the Republicans' plan using tobacco settlement funds. Additionally, I will take steps to the best of my ability to manage the complement and continue to find ways to streamline government services that do not harm Pennsylvanians and, in fact, make Pennsylvanians' services to Pennsylvanians better. I will also look for other assets in the state to monetize. Doing all this will put the Commonwealth in the best position possible to protect funding for schools, for senior programs, for hospitals, along with investments in our roads and bridges. Again, things that we all voted for back in June. This is not the outcome I wanted. Let's be clear. The House Republican foot dragging has led to one credit downgrade already and warnings of more. That means the Republicans in the House, by virtue of their inaction, and this is really important, have handed every single Pennsylvania taxpayer a tax increase. All so special interests don't have to pay their fair share. 
It means that every entity within the Commonwealth that has the Commonwealth's backing will have to pay higher interest rates. That affects school districts. It affects townships. It affects cities. It affects boroughs. It affects counties as well as the Commonwealth. Now we'll all have to pay more just to get the same. This is not just irresponsible. It's hypocritical. The very folks who have proclaimed themselves the protectors of the taxpayers' hard-earned money have blithely reached into the pockets of those same taxpayers. I've had enough of the games. In February, I presented a balanced budget with no broad-based taxes and more than $2 billion in cuts, savings, and efficiencies. It funded schools. It funded senior programs and hospitals. It upheld our commitment to create jobs. But in the time since my budget speech, House Republicans have again proven themselves incapable of completing their constitutional duty. And so I'm going to manage the finances of the Commonwealth until the House sees fit to do what it's supposed to do. I will make sure we protect education. I will make sure we protect our seniors. I will continue to do what we need to do to combat the opioid epidemic. And I will continue to do everything I can to create good paying jobs and attract good businesses to the Commonwealth. Again, this is not the way government is supposed to work. But I have to make sure that Pennsylvanians are not hurt. And so I'm going to have to act to protect investments that we all made earlier this year in Pennsylvania. Any questions? Yes. Uh, you I mentioned uh, managing the complement. What does that mean? Are you going to lay people off? No, the, if, no. Just by attrition, uh, just for example, there are 1,600 fewer people working in the executive branch now than there were back in December, just through attrition. The turnover is that great. So I will continue to work with agency executives, agency heads to manage the complement so that we're actually doing what we can to streamline government. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the securitization of the liquor control, how much of an annual payment are we talking about here and for how long? Uh, we're, we haven't negotiated yet, but just as an example, over a 20-year period, amortization with 4% interest, it would be about 85 to $87 million a year. Would that mean that the money that we normally get annually for the general fund, we'd have to ask for something over and above that from the liquor control board as well? We, last year, we got $210 million, so 85 is less than $210 million, and we could capitalize the first year payment. So if you want details on how that would work, again, we haven't negotiated it yet, and we'll have to see. The price will vary as to whether it's callable, non-callable, all kinds of things, but just as a general thing, yeah. Um, why securitize the liquor and instead of the tobacco fund? Uh, first of all, the, the tobacco settlement fund securitization, I, I mean, it's, it's something that, that we could do. Uh, I have a problem with that because there are programs that that uh, tobacco settlement fund actually funds and it would be, um, you know, we'd have a problem sustaining that if we, if we did that. So this seems to be something that, that is not going to uh, have the impact that securitizing the tobacco settlement fund would have. Um, do you believe that uh, now that the discharge resolution was voted in the House and failed, um, it seems like there might be an opportunity for that hotel tax proposal to start to get traction. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with, with uh, what I'm saying is that I, I'm tired of waiting. It's over three months, and I've been getting, uh, working with them, negotiating with them, and you know, we have agreements with, with four of the five parties here. We've gotten to the point where we've actually said, you know, I called meetings over the, the weekend of the, the leaders of the Senate and the House, and, and uh, we're all saying, you know, what, what is it that you want to do? And, and they can't even get the votes so far for the things they've said. They have called now, this is the third time they said we can't get the votes for proposals that, that we're making. This does not for, foreclose on anything that they want to, I'm just saying I'm tired of waiting. It's been waited over three months, and, and I'm not giving up on this process. I'm just saying Pennsylvanians need some certainty in this process. We can't keep waiting for, for a proposal that may come out of the Republicans in the House that they seem so far to be unable to deliver. Well, so if, if the tie turned on that, though, and, and say by, by um, the end of this week or any time, early next week, any time, any, any time, any time they want to do this. We hit the brakes on this stuff. I'm not doing breaks on anything. I'm managing with what I have to the best of my ability. If we actually had recurring revenue, if we actually get recurring revenue 
like a severance tax, for example, that's going to make it easier to do the things that we need to do to, to do this. But in the absence of that, I am going to have to manage. I can't sit here and just wait for something that over a three-month period has yet to appear, despite promises. Yeah. Today, uh, Governor, you mentioned the line in the sand, but it didn't sound like you were doing anything materially different than you've already been, been doing through this three months. That's right. Well, that's a good point. I have been managing this. Uh, but I've been managing it with the expectation that the Republicans in the House would deliver on the promises they made. Again, the Senate Republicans delivered on the promises they made. And I was expecting the same thing from people with whom shaking hands and looking them in the eye and getting promises. Um, but I just can't do that anymore. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to manage this. And, and there will be some, some things that, that uh, are going to be harder to do in the absence of that recurring revenue. Uh, I can't tell you exactly what those things are, but the basic things that we committed ourselves to back in June, protecting education at all levels, uh, protecting seniors, uh, protecting jobs and trying to create more jobs, and, and doing what we need to do to keep Pennsylvania in the forefront of the opioid epidemic uh, and, and fighting that epidemic, uh, I'm going to continue to do everything in my power uh, to address those, those issues. Yeah. Would the securitization of the liquor system uh, basically rule out any further privatization efforts? Maybe. You had a question. Um, yeah, just if this all goes forward, securitizing the liquor industry and everything, um, does that mean there's not going to be any more payment deferrals or spending freezes? What spending freezes are you talking about? Well, again, are, will there be any spending freezes? I guess payment deferrals. Is the uh, I'm, I'm hoping to, to do what I need to do to make sure that the schools get what they need, the human service organizations get what they need, uh, that we, we go forward with what we agreed to do in, in the budget back in, in June. Uh, again, I'm going to see a lot of that depends on how revenues come in. Uh, the General Assembly has authorized spending of money, and I am now, by default, the one who has to manage whatever revenues come in with what we have in place uh, to make sure that we end up with a balanced budget. And what I'm saying here is I am committed to doing that. How much that, that impinges on, on some, some of the things uh, in that, that appropriations budget, I don't know yet. Um, but uh, it would be a lot better if we had the budget revenue uh, the, the, to pay for the budget that we agreed to in, in June. Yes? Back in uh, early August, you froze about $183 million in discretionary spending. Are you looking at some more things of that nature? I'm looking at everything I need to do to balance this budget and manage the taxpayers' um, um, fund here. That's that's what I'm going to do, and I, I I did that in business, and I'm going to do it here. Yeah. Uh, Heather, have you talked to talk to the treasurer about this and whether your yes. is going to be enough for him to start resuming short-term funding? Uh, we didn't get into that conversation, but but I, I gave him a heads up that I was coming out and doing this, and he thought that was a good thing. But he can speak for himself. Yes. If they pass service tax or they pass some other tax, would you drop this plan to, to borrow? Yeah, I, let me be this is not this is not a discrete plan that is separate and apart from what, what I would do to manage this if I had uh, the revenues that were enshrined in, in my proposal, in the Senate proposal, in the different proposals that came from the Republican leadership in the House that they haven't gotten the votes for. Uh, it just means that given less that's going to come in. I'm going to still try to, to, to manage uh, this process. If at any point in time they come up with, with a, a budget proposal that passes muster in the Senate that, that I, can, I can sign on to, yeah, I will, I will uh, 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 move to that because that's going to give me uh, the, uh, the revenues that I need or that I'd like to have to make sure that all these things are protected. In the absence of that, I'm going to do the best I can. Basically, budget talks are have imploded, and there's no light at the end of the tunnel. But, but I guess my question to you is, in terms of dollars and cents, are you really that far apart in, in terms of solving this budget, uh, this revenue package problem? Yeah, we, we are apart. I think I think the 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 problem is that that we need about 500, 600 million dollars of recurring revenue, recurring revenue, not one time transfers, not something that says next year we're going to have to be back here talking about the same thing. We need recurring revenue. And, and again, that's why I proposed the severance tax. That's recurring revenue that every other gas producing state in the United States has. We don't have it here. But recurring revenue would, would really plug that hole. Again, keep in mind of the $3 billion deficit 
that we started this year with, I plugged over two billion of that with savings and streamlining. And again, just the, 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 the cut in the, the, the attrition in, in the uh, uh, complement of employees, the number of employees, 1,600 fewer employees, that's worth about 150 to 200 million dollars each year. That's recurring. So I will continue to do, do that kind of thing, and I think that's, but I still needed some recurring revenue. The Senate, I didn't agree, that wasn't, that's, I mean, I, that wasn't what I proposed, but I could agree to it. It was a compromise, what came out of the Senate uh, back in, in July. Um, the same kind of thing is, is what, what we need, and it's not a matter of a couple dollars, it's a matter of recurring, real recurring revenue so that we can finally get our arms around this budget deficit. This will close it. Could you be more specific about the look in your eyes, shake your hand promises? What were those promises and who broke them? Well, we had the, the, the first one was, was on a severance tax. The second one was on the uh, exemption, removal of the exemption, the elimination of the exemption for commercial storage. That was the House Republican idea. Then we had one came out late last night, I think actually was reported out of the, re the Rules Committee uh, on a hotel tax. So then, then we heard earlier today that they don't have the, the, uh, the votes for that. Did I understand you to say that the, the liquor securitization um, would raise about 1.2 billion? No, 1 billion, 250 million dollars. Okay. That's what we need to raise. One we think we need that. That's what would have raised, been raised by the tobacco securitization too. But that's what you hope to get from this liquor yes. securitization. Yes. Right. Is there a long payback tail on that? It's a 20-year amortization. Okay. But again, we haven't negotiated this, Charlie. I'm just giving you an illustration of what, at a 20-year period. At 4% interest, it was about 85 to $87 million a year. And we'd capitalize the first year. Governor, uh, what, Last what, question. What gives you the authority to do that with the Liquor Control Board? You couldn't just do it with the tobacco. The Liquor Control Board, actually, I don't have the ability to do that. The Liquor Control Board does. So I've spoken with uh, Tim Holden, the Chairman Holden, uh, and, and he didn't seem to think that would be a problem. So I'm, I'm making this uh, announcement the assumption that, that he will do what he said he was going to do. What happens with the aid to state related? Well, that's, that's a, the state related is Penn State, University of Pittsburgh, Temple, and uh, Lincoln University. Uh, that's called a non preferred uh, appropriations. That's sitting in the House of Representatives, uh, has not gotten to my desk. I'm assuming that if it does get to my desk, they will put the revenues in to pay for that $647 million price tag that it would cost to, to do this. But again, um, if that comes to my desk without revenues, I'll try to figure out a way to do that. But it makes it $647 million harder to do. Wait a minute. Dennis. So what degree, there's a, I don't know if you know, there's a gubernatorial election next year. To really? Uh, as I said in my comments, I think it has everything to do with it. I think a lot of people are playing politics here, um, and they weren't last year. And so we got a lot of things done the, 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 from, you know, uh, historic funding for education at all levels, early childhood, basic, higher education, to legalizing medical marijuana, uh, to pension reform that, that actually got uh, positive editorial reviews in the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post. When's the last time that ever happened? We've, we've addressed the opioid epidemic, uh, I think, in ways that most other states have not done. So we, we've done a lot of things to, together. And I think what's disappointing about this is, for some reason, that has stopped. And I don't understand why it stopped. Okay, thank you very much.